This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Marianne Fox was named the seventh chancellor of the University of California, San Diego in April of 2004 by the Board of Regents. She also holds the title of Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and has received honorary degrees from 12 institutions in the U.S. and abroad. No mean feat. Previously, Marianne was Chancellor and Distinguished University Professor of Chemistry at North Carolina State University. Thank you very much for coming today to learn a little bit about the research university and the challenges that we're facing. They are formidable challenges because uh, although in principle many agree about the importance of developing a workforce and getting new ideas, increasingly state by state around the United States there are smaller contributions from the government shifting the burden instead to the backs of the students. So I'd like to talk with you about, as this says, the research university and what it will do for innovation and the knowledge economy. So before I start talking about this, I just gave a talk this morning where people said, what is it that you are talking about at UC San Diego as being advances that have been made? Well, one is that one of our faculty has made what's called smart dust. And the smart dust when taken in as a pill, goes immediately to a cancer cell, and then a re upon irradiation with ultrasonic energy, lights up the cancer cell and kills it. So that's a good idea. <laughs> a second one is a new discovery from someone in computer science who was doing face recognition. Uh, you know, looking into a, a computer and having the recognition come forward. Be very useful, I thought, in many ways if you could put the same computer on a pair of eyeglasses. So you go to a social event and there's a little speaker that tells you who that person is. And... <laughs> but actually what they're using for this for is something else, and that is for women's cosmetics. The vision is that you'll go into a department store and this face recognition would take this face, put on different colors of makeup and so forth, different hairdos, and you'd see what you look like. And there's actually appreciable uh, interest in this, <laughs> not just by women, and I'd add as well. <laughs> so things that, that are serious are part of our research portfolio, things that are perhaps a little more lighthearted are part of our research portfolio, and it's just an example of what can be done at a research university. I hope I'm hitting the right thing, yeah. Many of you heard in the last several weeks that President Obama has made a national commitment to science and education and training. In fact, he said he, his goal is to double the investment in research and development over the next 10 years, recognizing, of course, that an investment in science and engineering is just that, an investment that will pay off in the future. He said that now's the time to jump, jumpstart job creation, restart lending, investing in energy, health care, education that will grow the economy. Energy, education, and health care, that's what UC San Diego is aiming to deliver at every stage. He said as well, a good education is no longer a pathway to an opportunity, it is a prerequisite. And you've seen that both in terms of UC San Diego students, where our graduation rate is one of the highest in the nation. You've also seen it in the Preuss School, where people from an underprivileged background whose parents have not finished college are going on essentially 100% to four-year colleges. President Obama also says that by 2020, America will once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world, something that we've slipped from in the last 20 years. So given that context, what is the role of a research institution in driving innovation and the knowledge-based economy? Well, first of all, the economic development is only possible if we have new knowledge. It requires innovation and it requires partnerships, and that's what we're trying to do at UC San Diego better than anywhere else in the world. 
One reason we can do that is that we have partners who are scientifically quite sophisticated nearby. Research in institutions are really agents of change that spur economic development, and strong research in, uh, institutions attract a level that is world class. The Salk, the, the Burnham, the Scripps Research Institute, the La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immunology, all represent possible collaborators for us that strengthen what we can offer ourselves. They also represent a source for high-tech uh, innovations. You can see the numbers here for U.S. universities, 3,000 new products, over 3,000 patents, <laughs> 1 billion in royalties, universities that have spun out 462 companies. All of these are indicators of how important research universities are to the economy. Regionally, between 95 and 2000, UCSD generated 400 patents, 400 and more active licenses. They started 89 companies. Remember that number from the before? We're contributing about 20% of the startups of the country in this region. 250 spin off companies, which account for 40% of our biotechs. So if you look even more closely at UC San Diego itself, Last year, we had 375 new disclosures to lead to inventions. That's more than one a day. Now, what does the federal government do to help? They provide, of course, support. They finance about a third of the nation's research enterprise, and they s encourage spinoffs because of the Bayh-Dole Act. In return, you can ask, what have this federal largesse done for our university? The reality is it's been a magnet for federal funding. UC's annual refunding, uh, research funding has been above $700 million for five years. It went over $800 just this last year. We're seventh in the nation according to the National Science Foundation. And although it says we're ranking second here among the School of Medicine, in federal funding per faculty member, it's actually first. So what should the state be doing to help us? First of all, the 50 U.S. states compete with each other. That is as, as it should be. But we do need to have support for the public universities from the state. We have to have opportunities for this research to go forward, and we have to convene community leaders to make this a welcome thing. If you think about the University of California, you can see that all these sources work together to promote intellectual property and to develop a new workforce. This is true whether we're talking about partners who are Spanish-speaking, for example, in Latin America. You can look at where the re institutions are through the University of California on this map. You can also look to see, in a graphic way, where collaborations exist. So you see UC San Diego at the very bottom of the slide. Each one of those blue lines represents another company and where there are interactions between UC San Diego and those companies. It's a progressively important part of our mission. So what is our role in economic development? Two years ago, we commissioned a, a consultant outside to look at our economic impact. We found we're the third largest employer, payroll of 81 million a month, 26,000 employees. You can see if UC San Diego were to miraculously disappear, this region would be in very serious trouble. It has been called a cluster of innovation by Michael Porter, professor at Harvard Business School, because of the very strong way in which UCSD as an institution connects with the community. In less than 20 years, this region has transformed itself, and I'm going to show you some statistics about that. Defense basically disappeared and was taken up by biotech and information technology. The research base continues to grow year after year, and it has increased significantly, even just on this campus, the number of space, spaces available for research. So here's the cluster employment data. Look at 1990. What you see in 1990 is that biotechnology and telecommunications were a fraction of defense manufacturing and software. If you skip over to 2002, just 12 years later, you can see that biotech has almost doubled. Telecommunications has increased by about 
Electronics is flat, software has increased, defense sp spending is down significantly to about a third of what it was. So this is what clusters allow you to do. There's some stability and fungibility from people who participate in the industry clusters and can move from one to another. Now why is this so usefully conducted in San Diego? It's because collaboration takes place here. It's very favorably regarded. Even those that have tenure are evaluated every three years on this university and, our, and collaboration is one of the things we look for. That collaboration requires research, it requires ability of the researchers, and it requires an investment. Research, talent, and money. Here's what the MESA looks like. The, the purple part is UCSD. It's surrounded by green dots. Those are our research partners. And you can see that they are not randomly distributed throughout the county. They are right on, on the, the uh, edge of UCSD. Let's look at biotech. In 1976, you see on the left side Hybritech, the first such biotech company. Fast forward to 2006, that's 30 years later, and we have pharma and biomedical investments all over the campus. Do the same with wireless. 30 years ago, all we had was Linkabit. Linkabit was a precursor to Qualcomm. And if you look at the wireless companies in 2006, you can see a wide dispersion of such companies throughout the uh, San Diego County. Again, not routine, not, random, not randomly distributed at all, concentrated at UCSD. So if you look at the high technology history of San Diego County, you go back to 1955 with General Atomics. You talk about Salk and their decision to come here. You talk about Hybritech, which I just described to you. One of the most important things that happened was that in 1985, UCSD Connect was formed. And soon thereafter, Qualcomm was formed, and the jobs just began to take off. There was a boom. So putting together money and talent and ideas allows just this kind of red line to take place so that by 2000 we were really noticed, being noticed worldwide for the, the uh, investments which were being made here. So if you look at what's happened, San Diego is a place where technology has converged. Biosense, bioscience companies, telecompanies, all of these interact with each other and to some degree can go back and forth. That is, we've grown in, in basic research. We've grown in the ability to collaborate. We have two major new clusters over the last several years that require a workforce that are well-trained, not only by UC San Diego, but also by San Diego State and our community colleges. And we've established strong linkages through UCSD Connect. So what else can universities do to benefit the economy besides research? Well, first of all, they generate knowledge. That knowledge is used by ever, anyone who's in the innovation business. Secondly, they have a growing population of educated people who improve the quality of life. Third, they have technical skills beyond, outside of science and engineering, the things that are needed to make a successful business. And fourth, they're able to codify that knowledge by using information tools that didn't exist several decades so that it can be transferred more effectively. And finally, we do this in an ethical way. We have a creative culture that supports the, the uh, activities which I've just described. So if we talk about science and technology commercialization, we know that we have to have products, but then we have to do something else. We have to have markets. We have to create new markets. We have to invent the companies and cause these companies to go forward, creating wealth and well-being for our people. We know that we can only do that if we have an international plan. And it's true that not only UC San Diego, but virtually every major research university is embracing globalization in some way or another. <coughs> Nations are investing together so that collaborations are not within one small area, but are worldwide. And increasingly, universities are collaborating and cooperating rather than competing all the time. San Diego, as you know, shares a border with Mexico. And until the recent spate of violence, 
we had a tremendous position in trade balance with Mexico. Hope that'll be restored soon. How can research universities work to optimize, optimize this? Well, one is to make sure that we understand that this is an investment. And it's an investment that also leads to peace with other regions. So interinstitutional exchange of faculty and students becomes very important not just this, what used to be sort of an upper class thing that you went to Europe in your <coughs> third year. Now study abroad really has content and it's almost required for a good position after graduation. How can they work in Latin America? Well, they can develop high tech clusters where Latin America contributes knowledge base as well. They can create international companies that will share and, and participate actively in trade. They can innovate and develop new ways of thinking about, about uh, innovation. So how can research universities commercialize? Well, it requires an investment. And intellectual property that is invented in one country or the other can be shared if investment is made correctly. A while ago, we had a visit with Columbia. The government of Columbia wanted to collaborate with research and indeed, what they've done is paid for 12 <coughs> postdoctoral fellows to come to UC San Diego so that we can do things that are uh, use the resources of Columbia in a much better way. That is, if we share facilities, we might have a f common framework for understanding each other much better than in the past. And it might be coordinated with other countries in Latin America. So what do we, as senior leaders of an institution, have to do in order to think about going forward? We need a clear vision for the campus. I believe the campus does have that. They understand what it means to be a research university. They've tried to build the trust, trust with the uh, citizens of California. And I know many of you are quite disappointed that the vote, vote just one week ago didn't step forward for the universities. We have to involve the campus in decision making. We have to remain committed to academic values and respond as we can, keeping our people well employed. The competencies that are necessary to achieve this are first of all, recognizing that creating value is a good thing. This is something that certainly wasn't the case as few as 20 or 30 years ago. We have to embrace accountability for the people for public institutions while we sustain an excellent product. We have to lead change and manage complexity. This is just some numbers to show you about what's happened recently to the university here. So it's a comparison from 1987 to 2007. So we're talking about 20 years. Undergraduate students have expanded by 62%. That's tremendous growth over two decades. Professional students by even a larger number buildings 49 percent in fact number of square feet and investment in the buildings since I've been here has been 1.8 billion dollars for 2 million square feet of space notice the major thing that's gone up is our total operating revenues have increased by almost 300 percent tripling in 20 years the only thing that remains small despite the fact that it has increased percentage wise is our endowment so by the numbers, you can see why it is such an incredible growth taking place on this campus. We do so by planning for the 21st century to be different than the 20th. We have to define the future, whether we're talking about economic, environmental, or regulatory factors. We have to know what our strengths are and focus on creating value. We have to be agile and have to manage through change, through difficult times financially. And you'll see in the next several years whether or not the administration here is of this type. We anticipate the future and look hard about ways in which it can be achieved. Now there's also demographic changes that are happening rapidly now. We know very well that more people will live longer. Global fertility is going down below replacement, especially in North America and Europe. And that means that those from the Southern Hemisphere are going to be dominant in the world uh, view. All age categories other than 0 to 19 will grow. Here's a striking statistic. By 2010, recall that's next year, 40% of our workforce will be retirement eligible. 40%. 
and recognize as well that developed countries are aging faster than undeveloped companies. Uh, countries. These are all statistics from the census. Another thing I think you should look at is that depending when you were born, you have different attitudes. So many of us in this room are in what is called the silent generation there at the top left. You're born before the completion of, the war, of World War II. You had a strong work ethic and you remained committed to one company. That certainly describes my father. The baby boomers, I was born in 47, so I'm one of the oldest baby boomers, <coughs> is a me generation. They were work-centric, they enjoyed life. But now we have Generation X and the millennials who are even more different. <coughs> generation X, born after 65, those who don't remember the assassination of John F. Kennedy, for example, tend to be family-centric, they job hop. Money is the primary motor motivator and they value diversity, something that was not a factor really for the silent generation or the baby boomers. And the ones that are coming through school now are different from Generation X. They're quite family-centric. They want work-life balance. They're affluent and they're prone to negotiation. So what are the realities? This is from a company that I've worked with in the past, Boston Scientific. They found that they are not able to obtain the kind of racial diversity that they'd like, and as a result, they're less attractive to these younger, student, younger people coming into their career. Diversity is greatest in non-exempt populations, that is, lower paid workers, and programs that do not highlight generational differences don't de be developed, don't develop at the same rate as those that do. So if we want to attract young people into a particular business, we've got to develop talent by interacting with someone who's been there. We have to focus on total rewards. We have to allow work arrangements that are flexible for them to have the kind of skills and competencies that they want to, to contribute to social responsibility. What have we done here? Well, in order to address all these questions as a managerial technique, we followed what I've called the three I's. Interdisciplinary work, international work, innovative work. By interdisciplinary work, what I mean is people from different disciplines. For example, medicine, someone in medicine might work with someone in computer science, or someone in literature might work with someone in biology. They do new and interesting things in new and interesting ways. International, what I mean is that we have study abroad programs with lots of nations, I think 26. We also have organizations that bring together particular partners who are, where we focused, and those are going forward. Innovation, we're looking at ways in which we can develop and commercialize new products based on our intellectual property. An indicator of that is we have a new department on this campus of nanoengineering, for example. These are the facilities that have been built just in the last five years. So if you had trouble parking, this is why. <laughs> I think if you look at that, you'll find some list that one of you or more have been involved in each one of them. And the themes that we follow is that what we're trying to do is to have local impact, national influence, and global reach. With these themes, we'll pro be able to provide the vision that's necessary to go forward in the future. So as you look at our campus, it's growing as we speak, think of the ways that you too can contribute. Think of the ways that you can spread the message about the importance of the research university to prosperity in the 21st century. And think about ways in which the interaction between different generations leads to a new way of managing this uh, impending growth. Thank you for, again for coming today. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you might have. Can you comment on the state's budget situation and what that's going to mean to the university? And does the success of the fundraising a few years ago impact that in any way? Okay, the question is, does the state's budget crisis impact the university and how does it do so? And how has philanthropy over the last several years allowed us to get over that bump? 
Well, first of all, the number that we were looking at as a cut for the University of California before last Tuesday was $322 million for our 10 campuses. It's almost beyond what you can believe, you can think about. Uh, part of the, of the strategy was that we might, might be able to convince the Obama administration to give $510 million over two years that would have mitigated that loss. So we don't have the answer yet from the stimulus plan, but we're hoping that it will mitigate some of the loss. Nonetheless, the fact is that last Tuesday's election doesn't allow us to stay on that trajectory, and we're going to have to go deeper than that. Probably we're going to be on cu cutting on the order of $30 million from our budget here. And you know, when I talk about one number and then another number, recognize I can't just convert money that's given for one purpose to another. So for example, if you as a donor decide you want to give money to the theater program, even though I recognize that I may have a larger need in, for biology labs, your investment is going to stay in the theater program because it's not fungible. So although we have a, mi a billion dollars raised over the last seven years as part of our capital campaign, very little of it is uncommitted and free for distribu distribution. But that which is will, will be saving us uh, very much. So what I'm asking for you today, those of you who have legislative contacts, be sure they understand how important the research university is. And if we were to simply disappear, the, the region very likely would collapse economically. Yes, sir. Uh, what are the uh, prospects, uh, if any, for a, a school of architecture and a school of law uh, to be part of UCSD? Well, you know, when I first accepted this position at UC San Diego, I started getting mail. And I kept piles of which issues. The first issue was, when was I going to start a football team? <laughs> <laughs> the second issue was, when was I going to start a law school? And the third issue was, why do, don't we have an architecture school? So first of all, recognize that in tight times when you're number three, even such a very uh, casual poll, you have to have a compelling reason for doing so. So the architectural community has not come forward nearly as much as the football community, <laughs> nor, the, uh, nor the law community. I can tell you the football community is not going to win. Uh, it, it's too much of an investment that we don't have the money for right now, even even from someone like me who grew up in Canton, Ohio, two blocks from the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Football is not going to happen while well, I'm chancellor anyway. Uh, the, the second, however, about law, uh, Cal Western School of Law has collaborated with UC San Diego for many years. We have lecture series together. We have a joint program for a master's degree that it involves le legal expertise and medical expertise. So they would be a logical place to start thinking about a school of law. In fact, there has been a proposal which is being considered by our faculty, which requires full analysis of the fiscal consequences in particular, but also of the quality of faculty. So we're in the process of studying it. I wouldn't hold my breath, but there is a possibility that law might happen. Chancellor Fox, on behalf of the Ocean Life Law and Learning Institute, I'd like to thank you for being here today. It's thank my you. pleasure. Congratulations.